Wait, there's the wrong one. Okay. Um, you want to go to I think, I think you had it in my, you sent it oh, to me though, didn't yeah. you? Yeah. Because I did look at it before. <laughs> Jess. Do you have actual PowerPoint on your computer? If not, it opens in Google Slides. Um, I have Office. I did. Okay. I did so get Office Word, but I don't think I've ever used, obviously <laughs> never used PowerPoint. I've used because I've used Excel and Word. Right. So. You don't have a printed. Um, yeah, I have my old one. Most of it's the same when I went through it. Okay. Um, it's just a couple things different. So hopefully we'll get some people. Is there notes on the slides? There is, yeah. Thank you. I may not be teaching again today. <laughs> I'll wait, obviously, for people. Yeah. We are set. Did you Hi, Mike. Oh, uh, yes. Um, this one's probably good, Jess. You know, so the same as the manual. That's good. Thank you. Hey, Mike. Oh, I lost Mike, are you there?
Mike, if you're there, I'm just waiting a few minutes to see if anyone else hops on. Yeah, I'm here, Melissa, I guess. Okay, <laughs> awesome. <laughs> I was having trouble getting it on my computer. Sorry, same computer. Oh, yes. Well, it looks like it's just me and you. <laughs> so we'll the, it'll be a quicker class if it's just me and you. <laughs> um, I'll get yep, you got an attentive I'll, I'll, uh, I'll get started and then if people join on like anyway. they can catch up. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. 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 I'm yeah, you're breaking up I a said, little okay. bit. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I'm in a hollow down here, and for some reason, some days it just, it just, the signal down here is terrible. Oh. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's even funny in the office. From the front to the back of the office, we have two different Wi-Fi networks. <laughs> I don't know. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so today we're doing the negotiate offers uh, session. So we're in the, the transaction part of Ignite and we're in the, the last uh, few sessions. Um, so we're going to cover the um, negotiating tips. Um, let me just, my screen is frozen. Just a sec here. There we go. So we're going to cover what is negotiation, uh, the three P's of negotiation, negotiating tips, then we'll recap, and uh, then the daily success system. Uh, so by the end of the session, you'll be able to explain negotiating offers, you'll be able to use the three P's approach, and recall and practice skills of negotiation. So um, a lot of the things around negotiation we'll see are um, asking the right questions and uh, so we'll get into that mm -hmm. my slides are a bit slow there we go so negotiating is not something to be avoided or feared. It's part of everyday life. That's a quote from Lee Steinberg, who is a sports agent and author. Um, so oftentimes there can be limiting beliefs around negotiate, negotiation. Um, and sometimes people have some fear around it. But if you think about some of the things you do in your everyday life, for example, buying a car is something that you most likely negotiated on, maybe not currently, but <laughs> in the past, uh, yeah. right? Sometimes like hotel up, hotel stays, you can negotiate for upgrades or extras. 
Um, and then even as far as, you know, negotiating with kids, <laughs> well, right? If you do, if you clean your room, you get to play PlayStation, for example. It's all part of negotiating tactics. So the first thing we're going to talk about I'm is here. what is negotiation? Oh, I can see you now. <laughs> um, so negotiation is an important part of the real estate agent's job. In Ignite, you've learned through NAR statistics that a real estate agent's ability to negotiate is one of the top reasons buyers and sellers look for an agent to help them in their search for sale. So we have um, what's called the Y4C2Ts as part of our, um, our values. And often you'll find that the Y4C2Ts um, applies and some of them more than others in negotiation. So negotiation is all about uh, going through the bargaining process and it's a give and take we're more parties, obviously, with its own aims yeah. and points. Uh, and everyone involved is seeking to discover common ground and reach an agreement to settle a matter of mutual concern or resolve a conflict. Negotiation is where one of our Y4C2 T's plays a big role. Which one do you think it is? I'm sorry. Say that again, Melissa. <laughs> Which one of our Y4C2 T's plays a big role in negotiation? Give me the three choices. I'm still trying to get it on the so, computer. So it's win-win or I'm no I'm just looking deal. at my phone. So yeah. I'll read them to you. Win-win or no deal. Integrity, do the right thing. Customers always come first. Commitment in all things. Communication, seek first to understand. Creativity, ideas before results. Teamwork, together everyone achieves more. Trust starts with honesty, equity, opportunities for all, and success results through people. And the question is what? Which, which one, one of those? Which one applies most to negotiation? I would say all of them, but I'm a win-win negotiator. So that would be my answer. Yep, you got it. That's the right answer. Um, it's definitely the win-win <laughs> or no deal because as an agent, you want to find a solution that benefits all parties. So obviously you're negotiating in the best interest of your client, whether you're on the buyer side or the seller side, um, but you also, want the other side to walk away feeling positive about the transaction and, uh, and about what everybody's come together to agree on. So although obviously your best interest is looking out for your client, um, you also want to make sure that the other party on the other side feels like it's a win-win for them and also their agent because when you're in the business, <laughs> for years, like we have been, you know that you come across agents, right? So if there's uh, someone who's really not negotiating in a win-win method, we'll say, um, then that can, that can have a uh, negative impact on how everybody's feeling about the transaction. So you wanna make sure that you're building relationships with your fellow industry members as well. So I always turn to the other one here, which is the communication seek first to understand. Yes. Um, and it because it's important to make sure that the lines of communication are open and that helps with the elements of negotiation so that you're not letting what can be sometimes a very stressful and emotional situation for everybody involved. You're not letting that um, emotion come through. Um, so you're kind of that wall or the block, so to speak, between your client and the other side. So maybe your client's feeling a really 
stressful emotional situation in what's happening um but you want to make sure that you're not taking that to the other side and and vice versa if you're getting it from the other agent you want to try to stop that really sort of emotional reaction and um, so i always i always remind agents when i'm talking to them especially on um broker calls to make sure you're not just reacting <laughs> but that you're actually take a breath calm like take a deep breath calm down and and right really really look to understand what they're communicating what they're why they're communicating what they're communicating and asking questions right so i think the win win is definitely the first one i think communication is another important one obviously integrity comes into everything we do trust as well comes into that in a way um but yeah it's important to just keep those emotions under control because that can then take you down the path and it's hard to kind of bring it back sometimes so that's that's important to think about i'm glad this is one-on-one -on -one, melissa because i wouldn't say or ask questions and i normally have to say that normally i wouldn't ask those questions but with you and i here I will ask these questions. Yes, we are recording though. I'll tell you that. <laughs> so, oh. so people can oh, watch our question. session. <laughs> I um, I took a four day negotiating course years and years ago, and uh, one of the things I realized when I get into real estate is a lot of times people write the offer, and they don't give us a lot of room to negotiate. You know, the the offers are too simple. So I've always created my own trading cards. And that way I have minor points to argue and I can give up my cards to go for the one that's most important to my clients. Is that a process that you would do as well? Because to me, when you talk about integrity, I question it sometimes and say, you know, am I or am I not? Yes. No, I agree with you. And I think that's part of um, asking the right questions so that you and I think we'll cover, I think we cover this later in the session too, but it's a, it's important to know what the most important thing is to your clients so that you can best represent them in the negotiation. So like you said, when you're talking about not necessarily laying all your cards on the table, but making sure you know what the most important one is, because, you know, for that particular person, that's the thing that is the deal breaker right? Like that, that's how we often refer to it. So, you know, what is the deal breaker for them? What's the most important thing? And it, it's interesting because it's going to be different for different people. And it's, that's why it's important that you're making sure you're asking the right questions of your clients so that you understand what is most important to them. So then when you are negotiating for them, you're making sure that you're not getting stuck on the little things that maybe don't matter so much but you're you're working towards the, the more important issue let me just expand on that because i don't think i made myself clear i'm also looking at the opposite side mm -hmm. i want to know what their trading cards are what's mm -hmm. important to them if they want a, a quick close i'll put my offer in for a long close even though my people want a quick close because that's a card I can give up easy. Yeah. Right. But I want to know where the trading cards are exactly. so I can give them stuff that's a blow value to us to get the important one for us. So you do that too. Yeah, I do. It depends on what it is, right? I feel, I feel better. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's all a strategy. Like, for example, like a quick it's, close. It's, if, it's a game if of, they it's, really it's, want the quick close, but my people are stuck on price, then I'll might give them the quick close. Yeah. And we come in a little lower on price because that's what that's what they want, right? Like that give and take. Yeah. It's a yeah. game of chess. You gotta know what the, the other side's thinking too. Yeah. Good. Yeah. And same thing with um, you know, if if obviously if it's a a vacant property and you know if you know a little bit more about the circumstances of why it might be vacant a quick close is also very appealing to them because often they don't necessarily want to carry it for months at a time and continue to pay mortgage and expenses 
right? Exactly. Right? Yeah. Right? It's knowing, yeah. knowing some of those things um, is uh, very helpful. <laughs> But I think a lot of people go in and they don't look at the bigger picture. You know, they just yeah. look at, at the little, yeah. the little one. So anyway, yeah, yeah good, good yeah. answer. Thank you. I've had uh, I've had clients who've become really good investigators. So as much as like some and and you know sometimes it's hard to get information out of the other side because we're designated agency and everyone's trying to protect their clients' position. So. You know, often I, I remember one time when we were I was in a showing, <laughs> we were in the the master bedroom or the primary bedroom now we call it, and they were in the closet and and the client goes, oh, There's only his clothes here. She must already be gone. <laughs> and I said, Well, that's very you're you're that's a good observation. I think you know there's obviously there's we've got two names here and only seem to be one living here, right? So you kind of know. Obviously, they're not going to tell you divorce, but you can sort of sometimes piece things together. So yeah, yeah, it was quite funny. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, that's exactly what I'm talking about, you know, and yeah, <laughs> whether the signs are there, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I just laughed. I was like, oh yeah, true, very true. <laughs> um so obviously uh, the paths to negotiation there are um two options after an off offer is presented uh, obviously it's presented and accepted which normally in normal circumstances that's not the uh <laughs> way it goes it's not usually that simple um so um I guess in the last two years, we've seen more of that, but um, typically an offer is rejected or countered um, and there's some negotiation involved in getting to that counter stage. And, and sometimes you'll, you'll get a counter and you're still not able to make it happen. And then you have to sort of go in with a new offer and renegotiate to then get to an accepted uh, or or in some cases, rejected position if they're too far apart. Um, so the idea is again, to make sure that you are um, in really good communication with your client. Um, and if you're, so that you've really gone through your buyer qualification and questions to make sure that you know what the buyer, what's important to the buyer, like we just chatted about. And if you're in the listing side, you wanna make sure that you've had the same conversation with your sellers to ensure that you know what is most important to them and that you've kind of through the process have uncovered some of the things that might be issues that come up on um, a negotiation or inspection items that they can kind of head off first. Um, that is, I find very helpful as well. Um, but at this point, when you get to this point, often there's a lot of time invested. So you want to get to the point where you're able to get an accepted offer, um, yeah. right? So. My most frustrating deal I ever had was, my God, it must be 15 years ago now. <clears throat> Excuse me. I was representing a car seller and the seller who was selling the house, he was a sales manager of somebody. And two win-lose negotiators I wrote seven offers on the house over a two week period, and we still never put the deal together. Wow. All, all over a furnace. And I even said to them, all you have to do is install it. My guy will take over the payments. Just lease the furnace. And no way would that guy even put in that furnace. Wow. And I, I couldn't believe it. Now, they sold the house. My guy bought a better house, I think. But Nonetheless, we tried over two weeks and seven offers, you know, and, and that's seven offers negotiating seven offers. God. So. Oh, it, yeah, it's yeah. It's incredible sometimes and some and like and some people get so um, stubborn <laughs> and yeah. won't budge off their position right and, and it's hard it's hard if someone is really digging their heels and to, to get them to see reason sometimes and anyway uh, yeah there's, there's, there's a lot, lot of win lose, lose negotiators yeah there are unfortunately there are um 
so we talked about this, I think, a little bit already, but who you negotiate with. So your clients, the agents on the other side, so buyers, sellers, et cetera. Um, and we just also, I think we've already, we already chatted about the importance of making sure, especially like you said, with a win-lose negotiation, whether it's the client or whether it's the agent, it's important to understand. Sometimes it's often it's the client and the agent is following the client's lawful instruction and they're doing what the client is asking of them. Um, and you'll know that when you encounter an agent that you've worked with before and they're acting out of the ordinary, so to speak, for them, you'll, you'll, you'll kind of pick up on it without them even saying anything, because obviously they can't, um, that they're they're following the, the client's instruction. Um, but most agents um, want to negotiate for a win-win, but not all. And the ones that don't, you'll you remember. And uh, often I find that reputation follows a person <laughs> in the industry, right? We're not, we're not that big of a, a group of industry members. So, you know, when when you have a market like we've encountered the last few years and you have people in competing offers, sometimes that can factor into it too. And I I know that I had they shouldn't have told me, but I've had an agent tell me I won in competing and I wasn't the best offer because they agent encourage the buyers that we would be easier to work with shouldn't have told us that but they did yeah. and, right so sometimes it can come down to that now as long as the the client is making the decision and not the agent well that's fine but the, obviously the client's getting that information based on the agent's previous experience working with another industry member so it's interesting I think we have to be very careful not to discredit a fellow industry member and there's a fine line in that because you want to look out for your client's best interest but at the same time if you know someone is going to be if you've encountered multiple difficult um dealings with someone in the past you kind of know how they work so yeah you have to be careful how you how you deal with that situation but yeah it's interesting how that does that does factor in and I think sometimes our uh, fellow industry members forget that part. <laughs> it's, uh, you know, <laughs> some of the agents leave the business for five years. I've seen come back into it for some reason or somehow. And you wonder how and why they did. But they're yeah. back in it again. And you're thinking, oh, my God. Like, I really don't want to do another deal with this person. It's really tough. Yeah. Um, just, just in a side note, before I forget, I just wanted to mention to you, Susan did an incredible job last week or earlier this week, last week. Yeah. On Ignite. Like, awesome. It, it was, I told her it was like university 101 in real estate. I mean, she, she talks fast. She covers a lot of ground. She's really, really clear. And she, she's just bang on. What a girl. That's awesome. Yeah. She's fantastic. Yeah, I mean, there's been other good ones. I like Brenda Kay is good, but yeah. I think Susan just sets it at a at a much higher bar. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Um, okay, so common points for negotiation, which we know are price, which typically is often the primary uh, factor, uh, and then terms. So whether it's financial time, i.e., closing date, conditions. Um, Etc. So some of the term elements um, could be repairs, inspection items, upgrades. Uh, if you're dealing in new construction, extras that that they're you know trying to get included in the uh, purchase price. So there often it comes down to price but it doesn't always come down to price and and i've seen that where um you know a, a a seller doesn't necessarily go with the offer that's the best price because the conditions uh of the second offer were better so you know sometimes it could come down to the fact that if if it's an older home and they want an inspection and perhaps they're Concern that there's going to be some things come up on the inspection, um, 
It could be uh, timing wise. So if they're tied into a closing date on their next property or a rental agreement, because we've got a lot of downsizing happening and people are tied into uh, you know, specific apartments that they want. So they're tied into a lease for a specific date, but maybe the building's not going to be ready till that date. So they can't, they can't take a quicker close where in most cases you think a quicker close would be uh, enticing to a seller. So um, it doesn't always come down to price. And, and it's funny that often people get hung up on that. And I know um, we've had some calls to the broker team where in competing offers, you know, they presented their offer, thought it was really strong, presented a letter along with it. And then the sale price gets published on the, when the, the property firms and the property sold for less than what they offered. And that's a question we've been asked, why didn't my offer win? What did I do wrong? And sometimes, sometimes you didn't do anything wrong, but often it comes down to the terms. If your price was higher, but you didn't win out, it's, it's often the terms. So I always advise um, agents to make sure they're asking the other side what the preferred closing date is. And if you're looking on Paragon, it will tell you if they've indicated in on the possession uh, on the cut, it, the, it'll tell you right there. Um, sometimes it doesn't and it'll just say negotiable. So I always ask and recommend that agents ask, what is their preferred closing date? What closing date do they want? Especially if you're competing, if you know, giving them their closing date is a huge advantage. Um, and then, you know, obviously the cleaner your offer can be, the better. Um, so, you know, we're, we, we were seeing a lot of inspection being waived. Now inspections are back. Uh, um, I would say you're seeing inspections sort of 80% of the time now. And um, financing is another one that factored in uh, for a lot of sellers when they were looking at competing. If, if there was no financing approval, then they can firm it up relatively quickly. Um, so the only thing I would caution that if you're on the buyer side and you're considering waiving financing, you need to ensure that they actually have the ability to purchase it <laughs> without financing and that you're not going to have an appraisal just kind of show up because then they are doing financing. So just be very um, cognizant of that. And because uh, that's some of the things that in the market we've seen in the last uh, two years that have been a little bit interesting, I'll say. Um, just speaking about that new construction, you guys do a fair bit of that. Do you find that the builders, obviously, and they're not dropping price, they rarely ever did, but do you find they're willing to give stuff up again now? Can you negotiate a, a deck or a stairway or appliance? More so now than you were than you were able to in the past. But yeah, you're right. Oh, okay. Sorry. Got it. Um, My phone. Got it. Sorry, fine. Are you logged in on another device? I'm trying to get the, the computer up and it finally came up. I think my phone is too close to it. Yeah. But, that's what it I, don't, is. I don't have the screen on yet. Just give me a second. Okay. Oh my God. No, I can't. I can't do that. <clears throat> I'm not getting a picture, but I'm getting the volume now. So anyway, okay, <laughs> we're back to the phone. Uh, so for new construction, yes, I would say um, we're still seeing that there isn't really any room for negotiation on pricing. There, there, the builders are all still very firm on their pricing. But yes, there, there is more opportunity to negotiate for extras or things to be included in the pricing. So it depends on the builder, depends on um, 
the price point of the home and you know how long it may have been sitting um but a lot of the builders still aren't building a whole lot on spec like there's not a whole lot of facsimiles that are like up and have been done and finished and sitting like they're they're putting them on and then as facsimiles and then they're building them out so you'll see the days on market look like they're a little bit longer now but it's because they're starting to list some of those um and while they're building them they're just having them on the market so that if someone wants to come along and uh, customize through the process that that they uh, are out there on mls um, yeah. but yeah yeah i would say definitely there's more ability to get some extras now than there than there was for sure yeah now now i'm going to take it back up track if it asked it a few minutes ago now we're de dealing with it's another <clears throat> nationality more so than ever before. You know, I've adjusted to the Ar Arabs coming in and I've adjusted to the Chinese and learned about feng shui and all that stuff. Now we have East Indians coming in and uh, they're different. Any pointers there? Um, well, I think that you just have to, like, like you said, um, learn about what, the strategies are for the different cultural elements because obviously um coming from different countries or different you know if clients are of a different nationality what is a normal negotiating process for them may be very different than what we are used to here so i think it's just educating yourself and also again it comes back to the communication with the client um, and setting the expectations up front so maybe you know, where, where they're from, they might be used to coming in really low under ask and they think they're going to have to like go back and forth 15 times to get something to come together. Whereas that, that typically is not the case here. If you come in way under ask and then keep trying to sort of barter, so to speak with, with a seller, you're, you tend to, to uh, insult the seller and kind of <laughs> you, they get their back up and then they don't want to work with you as much. So I think it's important to make sure you, if, if you're dealing with someone that's from a different nationality and that the bargaining process is a little bit different where they're from, um, that you're having that conversation with them up front and setting the expectation. Like this is how we do things here. If you're going to come in $50,000 under ask, you're going to get outright rejected and they're not gonna to wanna to work with us at all. So we need to be reasonable and this is how the process works. It's all about setting that expectation with people. Yeah. yeah. I'm not busy enough to have a lot of experience with, with East Indians, <coughs> sorry. But, <coughs> God. but what I'm finding is that from the small sampling that I have, they're win-lose negotiators, mm -hmm. but they will make a decision quick once we get in you know into it they don't yeah. want to drag it out but they want a better deal yeah and you got to get them over that hump so i just wondering how you're dealing with them but you're, you're experiencing the same thing obviously yeah yeah and, and i've only got a couple on the go you know but so it's a small sample but they both <laughs> from the same school yeah yeah um i think in the material there's some talk about um home warranty as terms uh, so that's not something that we typically see here in residential resale so that would be more in new construction if they're offering a new home warranty so yes. if they're registered with the home builder nova scotia home builders association then they provide atlantic home warranty if they're um not or they may just choose not to offer the atlantic Home warranty they could be offering the lux home warranty which is a similar product um done by an, a third party um if there's no if it's a new construction and there's no warranty then um you should be asking some questions <laughs> because and sometimes it's just the fact that it's a small time builder that you know only builds one or two houses a year and they just it doesn't financially make sense for them to be part of a warranty program um but just yeah make sure you're asking questions if you're i didn't think the banks would finance finance it without a, a warranty some will 
because they treat it yeah because they'll treat it more like um like you gen hired someone to general it okay yeah um but yeah it, it could come up as an issue um for the banks as well but yeah so just be aware of that and uh what else did they have here i'm just looking to see if there's any um closing costs is another thing that's in the materials that we we don't typically see that a whole lot anymore either um here uh lease back see some of that but not a whole lot in residential um lease back typically more so there's like a commercial element to it um and again that yeah you, ha you have to be very careful if you're looking into doing so any sort of lease back um do you still tell buyers that the uh, closing costs are about two and a half percent or three percent? Yeah. Depending on oil or electric. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I thought that may have changed. Doesn't matter. Yeah. Doesn't matter. Okay. Aha. Uh -huh. uh -huh. <laughs> I think we covered that. All right. So we're going to move on to the three P's of negotiation. So the three P's approach is um, first to prepare uh, and pre preparation is key to building confidence and ensuring a smooth negotiation process. Then we move into present, which is moving into the negotiation process by presenting the offer. And then position is when you're moving both parties closer until you have a full agreement. So. Um, Throughout this next section, we'll go into each of the three P's um, and talk about how, uh, how to go through the, that process. So for the first P, it's prepare, uh, and you wanna make sure that you uh, know your goal. So have a clear goal of reaching a win-win agreement in which both the buyer and seller are satisfied with the outcome of negotiation and remind your client of their motivation for moving or for buying the house. And that when the contract closes, they'll be able to move on with their lives. So this one is really uh, important, especially if you're, if you're dealing with, um, a situation where both sides are really close to coming together, but you just kind of like need to get them over the hump. And um, yeah. often, you know, if if they're only, you know, if it's just coming down to price and they're very close together, but they're just not quite there. Sometimes it's reframing the conversation and the question with the client. So, you know, if you're on the buyer side, it's are you willing to walk away from this house, which you told me was the perfect house for you because it had the fence backyard for the dog and the kids can walk to school and it has, you know, the home office because now you're working from home for, are you willing to walk away from all of what, all of these things that make this the, the perfect house for you for $5,000 or $10,000, right? So sometimes refocusing and putting in that perspective for them. Um, Ten dollars a month, right? Yeah. yeah, and if you and you and if you reframe <laughs> it that way, like that's going to be, you know, less than twenty five dollars a month on your mortgage amortized over twenty five years. Like, right? You, you reframe it that way, then they uh, it 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 helps them to <laughs> kind of go take a step back and go, oh yeah, you're right. Right. And then on the flip side, if you're on the seller side, you can have a very similar conversation, but it's reframing it more to what it's is important to them. So what's their goal and where are they going? So say they want to downsize and this is a, you know, a retirement move and they want to be, you know, moved into the apartment so that they can spend six years or six years, six months a year in Florida and six months a year in their apartment you know, where they can have their grandkids and do all the things, right? So yep. again, it's reframing it so that you can, you're bringing it back to what they want and what their goal is. So again, for example, it's, well, you told me that X was the most important to you. 
So if, you know, getting to Florida for six months of the winter is the most important to you, then do you really want to buy your house back for another, for $10,000? Because that's essentially what you're doing, right? So it's just reframing it. And sometimes you, you have to have that conversation with people to help them sort of take a step back and go, oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> right because they think the emotion starts to kick in so the logical thinking doesn't necessarily override the emotional thinking I've got. Um, and so some of that comes down to knowing your client so again making sure you understand their goals and what areas they're willing to negotiate on and where they're going to stand firm and think ahead is about anticipating what the other party intends to get out of the negotiation so um you know, looking at how you think you can counter the offer and how you plan to handle it. And then um, setting clear expectations prior to meeting the other party. So you want to make sure you set realistic expectations with your client. So the, 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 the phrase that we always talk about, um, under promise and over deliver, yes. very fitting for that. And you want to stress the importance of moving quickly to create a sense of urgency. And part of setting clear expectations with the client is being clear that win-lose agreements are likely to be rejected by the other side. So you want to, to be successful, you want to make it a win-win, which we chatted about. Uh, be informed. So before making an offer or counter offer, it's good practice to speak with two other agents, ask open-ended questions and use active listening to find out as much as you can about the other party and their agent. This helps to know who you're negotiating with and on what points you'll negotiate and where your clients would have leverage. And then finally, um, obey the laws, which is very important. Uh, so make sure that you're following our, uh, our laws and our Real Estate Trading Act. And if you have any questions, you can always call the broker team. Yep. And, uh, and then Lastly, oh, I skipped ahead, was obviously knowing the documents inside and out so that you're familiar with the forms and uh, the conditions. And now we have the lovely 408. So no, making sure that you are aware which clauses the 408 applies to and which ones it doesn't. So it's important. Um, so uh, we've talked a lot about asking the right questions. So this next part talks about asking purposeful questions. Um, so you wanna make sure that you're able to uncover their goals and objections and uh, it, before getting to them. And as you get the information, it'll strengthen your ability to negotiate and increase your chances of actually getting to a win-win. Um, so it, the benefits of asking questions is it's going to give you the points that you can negotiate on It'll give you insight on where you and your client have leverage. It'll set clear expectations. It'll allow you to get to know your client and their goal. And it helps you learn what will make a win-win for both parties. You guys are training the new hires too well. You take people like Sherry. Now you can't get anything out of them. She gives you <laughs> your social insurance number and her, her rank in the company. And that's it. We're shut down. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. <laughs> Um, so out of so there are two uh, types of questions, obviously open and closed questions. Um, so open-ended questions uh, have unlimited response options. So what additional information should I know? Uh, what is important about closing in 30 days? How do you feel about that? Uh, those are the open-ended examples. And then close. No, no, no. Melissa, sorry. Yep. Can I cut you, shut you down with this here? I used to teach sales management. Yeah. So open-ended question closing, that's that's old hat. Yeah. I used to push on that. Yes. So you get you, I don't need to go over it then. You know no. it. Um, so yes. Um, so the what would happen if question um helps you anticipate the next steps uh of the negotiation and sort of what their future planning is in their in their mind and then what a, why is that important to you again that's an important one to continue to ask them you got to get back to what's important to them yeah 
so this is the um, partnership. So this is just an exercise about um, reading the scenario that and then, yeah, yeah, and then asking the questions, which I don't think we need to do this part. No. So then presenting <laughs> this one always. I always find this really funny. And the first thing on the list is call the other agent. It seems so obvious, but now we've really lost that connection to agents. Don't you find? Like even, even to qualify that they received it. Right? It's it's I so I find that really interesting. Um and I mean there's a lot of texting, which is convenient and it's it's good if I know everybody's busy and sometimes texting is easier um but a, a call or a text at least like acknowledge acknowledge that you've sent them something gives yeah. them some sort of background right like presenting your offer doesn't mean just like emailing it off and like waiting <laughs> A response right so that's one of the things I find really interesting about how the industry has shifted the last couple of years because I find that there's not as much communication between agents right now and it's and I think that that's an important thing for us to have because like this whole section talks about with the presenting you can actually if you actually get to talk to them like you said sometimes you can get information yeah. that they maybe shouldn't share but they do. Um, and sometimes you can actually even read a response in a non response. Yeah, read between the lines. And sometimes, <laughs> right? so, sometimes the agent will say that to you. Mike, I can't yeah, tell you that, but read I, between the lines. Exactly. Right. Yeah. So, so I, I mean, there is a lot of benefit in actually talking to the other person. Anyway, that that's my like soapbox. <laughs> Well, you know, you got in on the tail end of the old school, and I'd almost say that I did the same thing yeah. because the board was much more active in getting agents together yeah. prior to me getting in the business. And then all of a sudden it really got condensed down. No more Christmas party. There was a golf tournament once a year. And other than training sessions or the annual G AGM, we never saw each other. Yeah. But prior to that, all the agents in the city knew each other. If they weren't friends, they at least knew each other enough to talk. Yeah. So when you put an offer in, it was easy to have a conversation. Now you have no idea who you're talking with. You don't even know what they look like. Why would you say anything to them? Yeah. And, and, and they're hurting our industry. We, I think we've got to get back to having a collective group of people. You know, we're all yeah. trying to say, you know, like, we're not adversarial, we're teams, you know? Exactly. We want, we want to have both sides win. Yeah. You know, we want to have, um, you know, e even with the other eight, you know, we both want the same outcome. The seller wants to sell, the buyer wants to buy. Our job is to make it easy for both parties. Yeah. So why don't we know each other so we can be an effective intermediary? Exactly. And, if, and it comes down to like, even you think about the simple, like, wording cooperating brokerage it's yes so cooperating with each other right anyway yeah but so yeah i'm i'm a big like i'm a big believer in that it it really makes a difference to actually talk to the agent or at minimum get some sort of like communication between the two of you where you actually do present your offer to them like don't just like send it off and not do anything um and then obviously uh you know the rest of the points here are <laughs> skipped a bit here just a second um here we go uh so uh, the next part is positioning um so once you've prepared presented now you're positioning and that's about moving everybody closer to an agreement. So you want to make sure that you acknowledge the common ground and look for the places where both sides are in agreement. And that helps uncover what you can adjust and versus what things are sort of set in stone. 
And then you want to use what and how questions uh, to help understand what each side's priorities are and um, sort of drill down to what's important. And then understand that it's a process. So there could be some back and forth multiple times. And then obviously um, you want to keep coming back to working at it as a win-win. And, and then lastly, there is a time when it's not going to be a win-win there. And you, you have to know when it's, you have to cut your losses and just walk away. Right. Yeah. Which happens. Uh, so this is another role playing exercise. I don't think we need to do that, Mike. You? No, no. We'll skip through that. All right. So we're coming to negotiating tips. So uh, this next part, some of these are, you know, pretty self-explanatory. <laughs> Be professional. Um, keep your goal in mind. So obviously that's a signed contract uh, and getting what your, your clients want to achieve that. Um, control what you say to anyone involved in the transaction, which we talked about. So again, like making sure you don't create anxiety in your client or, on, or with the other agent, because um, then that can reduce their negotiating position. Uh, continually refer to motivation. So remind your client why they intend to buy or sell, which we chatted about. Uh, don't reveal too much. Listen more than talk and keep your client's uh, motivation close to your chest. And don't be attached to the outcome. And I think that's one that we found with, um, with a lot of the newer agents that have been getting in the business, that, that they struggle with that. Not, yeah. Right? Um, so you, you, that's something I think you learn over time, but it's important to, to not be attached to the outcome. You're not going to get every single deal you do together. Right. Sometimes when you're it's new, not new possible. Negotiations, yeah. When you're new in negotiations, you think it's a fixed point, you don't yeah. realize it's floating. Yeah. 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 There's no wild deal. It's just as close as you can get. Exactly. Yeah. All right. Okay, so next, aha's to achievements. So I'm just looking, did they skip the, looks like they, they skipped the um, nonverbal cues, which is interesting, because I always found that part interesting. The, um, like when you're talking to people, how we were chatting about how, if you actually do get to have a conversation with them, you can tell by how they're, reacting and how they're conversing with you so if they're yeah. like really upbeat or um like talking fast versus they're more positive whereas if they're sort of monotone or like talking kind of slow and blah and low then they're more negative right like you can read into some of that you don't yeah. necessarily get to see them face to face but you do your clients um so again, looking at like nonverbal cues, obviously if they're like sitting back and their arms and they're like have an open posture, they're more positive. But if they're like sitting there with their arms crossed and their legs crossed, like you know that that's a more negative. Um, but the uh, problem is we don't see them anymore. Right? You know? and, yeah. And I, I like dealing with people face to face. I like talking to people face to face. Yeah. Um, you know, so that that hurts me, and 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 again, my company used to teach negotiating skills, so been through that a lot of times, and you know, yeah. body language, and I can tell you some good examples of that when I was selling training, but uh, yeah, we we've we've lost that, and and when it's verbal, you know, you used to clue in if people were getting guarded with their answers, but now yeah. everybody's guarded, yeah. right? We, yeah. We've lost that advantage. Yeah. And everyone says, I'm not allowed to say anything. I'm not allowed to say anything. Yeah. Yeah. And I think from the client perspective too, it's important to, to make sure like you're mirroring and matching them too. So, yes. right. So that you, especially if you 
it, once you have had some conversations with them, and obviously if you've gone through your consultation and with them, whether they're on the seller side or the buyer side, you then have a, a, a really good feel for what their personality type is and what their sort of learning style is like. So it's important that like, if you're dealing with someone who is like, I always go back to the disc, right? And if, if you're dealing with someone who's like a, a high C, then they're really detailed and really analytical and they want they want you to like review every single piece of the contract right whereas if they're if they're a d they're they're like dominant and they're fast and they want <laughs> they want things done like now like just tell me the price show me where to sign done like right so i think it's a, that's another part so they, this is the new version of Ignite, but we used to talk about that in, in this session in the old version of Ignite. And I liked that because um, it's important to keep that in mind, that sort of mirroring, matching who you're, who you're communicating with and who you're dealing and, with. And that, that should be ongoing training, I think, Melissa. Yeah. What, I, what I find I have a big challenge with is my hearing is going, going bad, so I'm not hearing as clearly as I used to. But dealing with accents, I spend so much time just trying to figure out what the devil is trying to say to me yeah. that I forget everything else around me. I'm just trying to, what are they saying? And I know how many times I say, I'm sorry, you know, can you say that again? You know, because yeah. I don't understand. Um, and we okay. can't change that. No, you can't. You can't change that. Them again. Oh, there we go. Oh, so this is the daily success system. So this is talking about how um, you're gonna you'll take 20 minutes to role play conversations with a partner and the importance of practicing that every day, and then 10 minutes to prepare a call list for the day. This is another system that agents use to save time. And then uh, role playing, which is making contact, having conversations with as many people as possible with the goal of establishing and nurturing relationships so that when people are ready to buy and sell, they think of you first. So that's that top of mind training we always talk about, right? They, yeah. You want to be top of mind so that when they're ready to make that decision or they know, you know, their friend, family member, whoever is ready to make that decision to buy or sell that they think of you first. Yeah. And then, um, and then finally updating your database with the information you've gathered from your conversations um, after you do your calls, etc. cetera. So, so this is the daily success system. So how many of your convers 10 conversations, your 10 contacts added to your database, your handwritten notes, social media engagement, um, which then leads to enrichment, appointments, agreements, closings, et cetera. The whole funnel, which you know, I don't have to. Um, so the next part that, that is, the reminder that is in all of the Ignite sessions is the do not call list. Um, and that's my disclaimer is to make sure that if you are calling, cold calling, first of all, that you need to verify against the do not call list, which we have uh, bought the list as a brokerage and Jessica has that and she's updating it. So if you are doing any cold calling, you need to reach out to her and she will share the um, Google Drive link with you so you can search it. So you just control F with their name and you can see if they're in there. Um, and then the other thing to keep in mind that we have been talking about is that the Canadian um, regulations for the do not call list, um, if you are in a contractual relationship with a client, then you do you are allowed to call them even if they are on the do not call list but it's for a period of 18 months so if your buyer's designated brokerage agreement or your seller designated brokerage agreement expired 
or closed and then expired, um, then you have 18 months to contact them. And beyond that, even though they're a past client, if they are on the do not call list, you need to get permission to call them. So there have been some pretty significant fines from the CRTC now coming out against um, agents and brokerages in other parts of the country around do not call. So that's why there's been so much around it. And in the States, their, theirs is do not call and the TCPA. And it's they've had some really big uh, court cases um, around this. So that's why you're seeing this in all of Ignite. So, <clears throat> excuse me, if you have a client and you get permission in writing, can that be everlasting? That's a good question. I don't think <laughs> we have an actual answer on that. So okay. I would say um, as long as you have, yeah, as long as you have some written permission that you can contact them, then I would say that that there wouldn't be an expiry on it. Yeah. But right now, the way it stands is that it's 18 months from when you've basically been in a contractual relationship with them or transacted with them. Yeah. In this relationship. Yeah. Uh, this is just an affirmation. I engage every conversation in the spirit of contribution and people are happy to be in relationship with me. This is to like set you up in a positive frame of mind for your calls. Uh, so this is a role play. So, well, you can sure assume this session without role play, eh? <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot quicker. Yeah. Um, so we can keep going with that. And then your conversation list. Um, so you'll, um, that's to determine who you're going to call for your lead generation and then calling them, reaching them out on social media, et cetera. There we go. And then lead generation conversation. So that again, you see the <laughs> disclaimer on everything now. Um, so this is um, going through your lead gen conversations that you just set up and calling to, um, to see if anyone is interested in buying, selling, or investing in real estate. And then- yeah, and, and new hires don't get the importance of that enough. You know, I, I think I think that when you guys do your training, you should make sure that you have um, current uh, scenarios where it's happened. Yeah. You know? Um, here a month ago on Facebook, I have a friend from 40 years ago living in Calgary and we're on Facebook and we comment on pictures every now and then, but we don't have conversations, you know, we're not drinking buddies anymore or anything like that. We've worked together 40 years ago and he put on there that uh, he was going to retire and move to his condo. And I knew he had inherited a condo in Halifax, so I wasn't going to get the buying side, but I reached out to him and I found out a little bit more about it and said, look, I know a couple agents in Calgary. They're really good. You know, would you like me to refer one to you? And he said, yeah, that'd be great. Thanks. So I got a referral to that. Perfect. But that's 40 years ago, you know, and yeah. people are hesitant to call people they know. But if you had three or four of those examples, every time you brought that subject up, whether in your training or a meeting, yeah. I think the new hires would clue in a little bit more and say, and in the first Ignite that I went to, I think it was Ignite, the facilitator stopped using data database. Did you hear that? Oh, yes. It's now a data bank. Yes. And again, it gets people focused that all those numbers are money. It's money in the bank if you contact them. And it's money yep. in someone else's bank if you don't contact. Exactly. But it's a bank. Yeah. That's why Jess is, is starting the um, 201 Club. And that, I think that, that was right? brilliant. Because okay. KW has been studying it. And it's been shown that people who have more than 201 contacts in their database make more in GCI than those who don't. Yeah. And, and her whole um, plan is around creating specific things 
to help you follow up and get in contact with those people because just having them in there is not enough, right? And so that's that's part of that training that that she's rolling out now is yeah. to help agents go through that and grow their database and then communicate with them because you have to be systematic in how you communicate with them. You can't just, yeah. right? And And like to your point, there is opportunity everywhere, everywhere, yeah. right? So whether it's, you know, someone you know from years ago in another city that's moving or whether it's, you know, for, for some of us clients that we dealt with years ago that are now doing the move up or move down or the kids are buying houses now, right? And like, so like there's there's opportunity everywhere. So that's why it's so important to create that um, system in your database and nothing else, just keep in contact with people, right? Yeah. And I know you recognize it because you see it in Aaron, but Jessica's doing a tremendous job all the time and adding value to herself. So she's, you did a real good job finding her. Thank you, yes. <laughs> She's doing, she's doing incredible things. Um, but yeah, that's, that's the whole thing that like why she's doing that 201 club. Um, and that's this whole section here is about adding the contacts from your follow up to your database, right? And then going through to make sure that you're actually communicating with them. Yeah. And then, and then we talk about celebrating successes. And this is just a highlight of the daily success system that we just talked about. And then uh, KW command and connect. So again, that's Jess is now doing the 201 club and um, she has the ability there. They've just released the um, ability that you can transfer your contacts from your phone right into command too, which is wonderful. Awesome. Right. So that makes it so much easier. And then this is just a reminder about all the training on KW Connect. And um, and then of course, Jess has our own website as well that has all our training videos and like important um, documents like deposit info, buyer waiver, et cetera. So that's all on our KW site. That's and on the that's on the KW select.ca yeah okay yeah so if you haven't been on that um if you go out you the drop down menu it says agent resources yeah. and then you you log in so if you haven't logged in yet you'll just you can use your email and your like your your if you have a gmail or kw email you can use that in your password and then just it'll send an email to jess to approve you as a user and she'll hit approve and then that'll be your your login but we had to put a login on it because uh with all the training videos and stuff there we just had to change it up a bit and um people were finding the weebly and the um google drive a little bit. oops what i just dropped oh <laughs> dropped the phone um <laughs> if people were finding um Weebly wasn't as user friendly, and and so then we thought, well, the Google Drive would be better. So she put everything in Google Drive, but people found that wasn't as user friendly either. So she's developed this whole website now, um, and everything's much more user friendly and much more like pleasing to look at as far as like layout and things. So yeah, so if you haven't been on there, um, check it out because that's where we've got all kinds of our all our basically all the recordings from all of this training sessions are there. Too. Melissa, I'm terrible on a computer just because I wipe out my databases and I had to get my uh, my main computer totally wiped out at uh, at uh, the Apple store here, I don't know, three months ago. I fell asleep while using it and somewhere or another was I messed up and I couldn't get in with my password. It timed me out and they couldn't do anything but wipe my hard drive clean. So oh, I had... Wow. I had a backup in my house, a wireless backup that I would back up to, but of course my password is in that database on my on my computer, so it's gone. So I can't access my my backup. So I've lost everything. Oh, and that's something. So the only thing I have is whatever was on my phone. So 
So um, my question I was going to there is with that KW uh, website. Yep. How do you how do you save that? Do you put it as an icon on your on your main screen? Okay. Yeah, I have it saved. Um, I have it saved on my uh, like when I open my web browser. Like if I go into uh, Chrome, I have it saved as one of my bookmarks, so I can just okay. click right there. And... I did that. Now I can't. I can't find it. You know, so yeah. I got to put it on my screen. I guess. Yeah. Yep. Make okay. it a, a shortcut or a bookmark, so then you can get to it easily. I need a whole day with Jessica just to sort <laughs> <Yeah>. me out. <laughs> but Sherry's offered to help me too. She's pretty smart. Who's that? Sherry. Oh yes, she is very. I was I was complaining there at her last uh, at her last meeting, and uh, you know she stepped up and said, "Mike, like I'll help you." Like I'm. They tell me I'm really good at this. So she said, you know, just uh, make an appointment with me. And I, ah, so bad at appointments, you know. And she's over in Dartmouth, and I'm over in Spryfield. And she said, well, you know, I'll meet you at the office. So, yeah, okay. So yeah, I got to yeah. take her up on that. That's but I don't, fun I don't function in the mornings very well. I, I'm too full of pain. I can't really even walk until about noontime when things are loosening up and my pulse have set in. Yeah. So if you saw me at the meeting there last Wednesday, it was a bad day. You know, it's one of the few times I've had to use a cane, yeah. but I still have to take it with me. Not that I need it, but I need to have it when I do need it. And so, you know, I'd rather hang it around my neck. But anyway, I wouldn't let them operate on my spine, but I'm second guessing myself now. And I think the next time I see the surgeon, I'm going to say yes. I can't, I can't function this way. And and I take this training just to kind of keep me up, but I'm not really yeah. using it. If I do a deal every three months, you know, that's that's the extent of my my business now. But I can't go out there and walk the streets and knock on doors or, you know, even even showing houses, two story houses. You know, by the time I get in, I can show the main floor and I might get upstairs, but I won't get down to the basement. Uh... You know. So I'm so all I'm doing is taking the training just to to stay up and you know someone answered me a question asked me a question hopefully i give them an intelligent response other than something i i used to know but i don't anymore yeah yeah good